Uh, welcome everyone to today's uh, Lean Learning Series training. My name is John Sears. I have successfully remembered to remind everyone that my name is John Sears. I'm the Lean Coordinator for DEC. And uh, this is the fourth training in our series. Um, today we're going to be talking about um, how to have more effective meetings. Um, I went out of my way to make a training probably unlike um, most other meeting trainings you might have attended. So we'll see how that goes, and I look forward to taking you all on that journey with me. All right. Go ahead and launch the training. Spoilers ahead. All right. So it's couched as running and effective. That is the wrong screen there. Let's try and do that. John, I've been. John, Sorry. I've been trying to I've been messing around with that a little bit and there's something I don't use presentation mode much. But there's something where you can, yeah, okay, you can split it between your two screens. Yeah. Yeah, it's not um, on the screen that I would like it to be. I mean, it's probably up here in display settings. Yeah, swap it. Um, but this is fine. Um, so, running an effective online meeting is the focus of today's training. The online piece of it is going to be a much smaller piece because really, running an effective training is, or running an effective meeting is an effective meeting whether you're doing it online or otherwise, but I'll have some tips and tricks towards the end that will allow us to focus it on an online effort. So I want to start where a lot of these trainings typically end, which is a bunch of stuff you probably already know, and that's these are the things that you should do or have for your meeting in order for it to be effective. So before the meeting, you want to have a goal you want to have an agenda, you want to have an essential team with just the necessary members on it, and you want to have circulated background information before it so everyone can arrive at a meeting well informed. During the meeting, uh, you want people to arrive on time and start promptly. You want to manage your time well throughout the meeting, and you want participation. So in meetings, everyone is sort of on a level and that's how we get our best ideas and creativity out there is that everyone participates. And then record the discussion so that when you come back, you're not revisiting this thing in subsequent meetings. After the meeting, you want to mark decisions and um, any elements that are sort of out of scope for the meeting get marked on the parking lot and they are elements for future discussions. And you can follow up with those meetings. So. These are all things that we're supposed to do in meetings. The reality is, is that we don't. Um, so how many of you feel like you your team does a significant portion of these? And I actually can't see the chat window right now, so if someone wants to chime in and say they know some of this is going really well love to hear it probably 50 50 50 50 sure yeah and it depends on the meeting too a lot of the times right some meetings are yeah. really i think this is christina at the agency of ag and i think we have some standing meetings that um a lot of this doesn't happen for whereas you know, when we have kind of a, a special meeting we're calling, we might be, we might have the time to put more effort into developing the agenda and making sure we're getting what we need out of it. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense and it'll really tie in nicely with some of the things we're going to talk about today. So if we all agree that these are things that we should do in our meetings and we spend a lot, we spend a lot more of our time in those reoccurring regular meetings than we do in those special meetings. Why do we only do it for the special meetings and why is it important to do these things? Um, and, and for what it's worth, you should do these things and we all know we should do these things, but yet we don't. And it's important because 
we are in a lot of meetings. And so this is based on a recent survey, and it's purely of the Department of Environmental Conservation. But collectively, the department, which is about 300 people, spends 2,000 hours per week in meetings. So the average DEC employee is in meetings 6.7 hours a week, so a little bit less than one day a week. Um, the average manager and supervisor, I think understandably, spends a larger percentage of their time, about 25% of their week in meetings, whereas the average staff person spends about half a day in meetings. And when we ask people uh, what the primary meeting problems they saw were, there were a couple that really stood out. So uh, lack of outcomes, action items, and minutes, 76% of respondents identified that is a problem. Um, this might be a unique to us problem, but um, finding a room was rated at a 70%. Uh, not following agenda off topic side conversations was 60%. And even uh, some problems were unique to individuals, so no travel time between meetings. Obviously, that's a, an issue if you've got back to back to back meetings. But even these less popular meeting issues are still hovering around 50%. So clearly a lot of the meetings we go to are not meeting all of those requirements or elements that make a successful meeting that we identified before. Um, anyone have any other meeting issues that they've noticed or identified that aren't listed here? Um, John, I think, and maybe it ties to action items, I'm not sure, but I find that sometimes people just don't have the time to follow up on the actions. So we'll come up with a, a list of actions to do a lot of the time, but then they just don't get followed up on. Absolutely. I would say that's our exact problem as well. It's the actual follow through when you're bouncing from meeting to meeting all the time. Yeah, I agree with that because the minute you go to the next meeting, you get a new set of action items and the first are quickly forgotten. John, this is Gerald. One thing I've noticed on the late meeting thing is how many people have meetings that last till five or 10 minutes after the scheduled time and at the DEC, the, the meeting rooms are scheduled. So I so you have 10 people show up at a meeting and there's three people in the meeting room who are spending another five minutes. Yeah. So that means the first me the second meeting starts five minutes late to begin with. Yep. And you've had 10 people standing around for five minutes each. That's an hour of wasted time. Absolutely. Yeah, that definitely I mean, adds up. It adds up. And I think I'm pretty aggressive about walking in on meetings once their time limits up. It's, you know, my theory is also that, you know, nine out of 10 me people in that late meeting have other places to go and really want to get going <laughs> and right. get out of there. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and on the issue of uh, not following up from meetings and having things actually implemented, that's definitely, um, one of the primary hurdles in lean, right? We can have a great lean event and everyone agrees on what needs to happen, but then making the space and time to actually do that is a huge hurdle. So I absolutely hear you there. And uh, hopefully today's meeting, today's training, we'll talk about that a little bit. So it's worth asking the question and we won't get deeply into the philosophy of it, but what meetings are meant to do. And there are, this is taken from the um, NOAA offices and their um, understanding of trainings. And basically, there are four main categories of meetings that happen. So informational, consulting, discussion, and collaborative meetings. So the informing meeting decides and informs. It's really a communication platform. There's not a lot of back and forth. Whereas consulting meetings gather a little bit more input, building all the way up to collaboration, which is a, an involvement between all parties involved. So it's, it's really a measurement of 
uh, where the control is, but also where the level of um, conversation is at. An informative meeting might have one person talking and everyone else listening. A collaborative meeting should have everyone talking and working together. And each one sort of has a different set of goals and responsibilities. Um, do we need meetings to do all of these things? Where is the line where a meeting is required or could it be something that could be handled via a chat or an email? Anyone have any idea about um, where the line for them is as to when you need a meeting versus when you just need to send an email or start a chat window? Um, I think that it de this is Mercedes um, with DC. I think it it depends. It depends on the complexity of the issue, but I feel like sometimes it also depends on the person that you're trying to reach out to try to solve the issue, um, because some people are a little bit more particular when it comes to their schedule, so they. They, if they're more organized or they feel that works best for them, um, they would want a meeting so they can mentally prepare, not mentally, but also depending on the issue, what kind of material or whatever they need to be prepared for it um, versus some other people might prefer you just um, chatting or video chatting, you know. I don't know what everybody's everybody else's experiences. Anyone else have any thoughts? I think one that there's, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Rebecca. Um, I think that when there is crossover between the different meeting types, if there's information that first needs to be given, then followed up by you know input and decision-making, it's much easier to do that in the context of a meeting versus several different series of emails. Mm -hmm. I Someone put up, um, I think Margaret said, if there's two or three emails or chats, then a phone call becomes more efficient. I, I totally agree with that. I've found that particularly on complex issues, um, the email thread can get more and more circular and people are getting dropped off of it that need to be there for decisions. And I think sometimes it's difficult to convey intent in an email in a way that yep. you can do really quickly in a meeting um, and keep things very cordial and, and collaborative. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Yeah. And does anyone ever feel like sometimes a meeting is set up just to make space to work on a thing that otherwise it just wouldn't happen? All the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And when that's happening, you're not really informing, consulting, discussing, or collaborating. You're just making space. And um, that sort of feeds into our next point, which is a meeting should serve one of, well, it, it should be fundamentally based on two things what the meeting goal is and what the deliverable is. Um, when a meeting isn't governed by that, you get sort of a feedback cycle on meetings. And this is partially why um, ongoing staff meetings or basically any repeated meeting gets out of control. And don't worry, we're gonna explain this diagram here in a second. But um, one of the things that I really noticed, and I, I've seen this come up a number of times is that Everyone that doesn't have a staff meeting, like a reoccurring regular meeting, uh, wishes they had one. And everyone that has one wishes they weren't having them. And it's a really fun trait of staff meetings because staff meetings and those kinds of reoccurring meetings generally don't come with a goal or a deliverable. And it's because of that that things tend to spiral out of control and they feel very fruitless and ineffective to people that have them. But there are genuine issues that you want to bring up and discuss that people that aren't having these meetings are wishing they had space to talk about. So I want to talk a little bit about um, the circle that you can see here. So this is um, 
based on some principles in systems design, which is a course taught by um, IDEO and um, has some really interesting ideas, but it's all about feedback cycles. So where you see a plus sign right here and a plus sign right here, it means it's a positive feedback. So um, as the number of meeting attendees goes up, the meeting complexity goes up. As the meeting complexity goes up, the meeting pace goes down. So the more people you have in a meeting, the longer it seems to take because everyone needs to have their say and things get more complex and people bring up other issues, which further complicates things and it really can drag the meeting pace down. As the meeting pace goes down, the number of unaddressed topics goes up. So basically, if you had a parking lot, the number of things on the parking lot go up. If you don't have a parking lot, then those are all things that need to be discussed in the meeting. So the number of unaddressed topics is going up, which means the meeting scope is going up. And as the meeting scope goes up, that means in future meetings, you'll need more attendees, which leads to more meeting complexity, which leads to a slower pace, which leads to more unaddressed topics. And you can see how these feedback cycles can sort of run out of control. And what is a fundamental idea in systems design is understanding the levers that we have to control um, in, in terms of governing whether the cycle repeats and how bad it can get. So does anyone have a staff meeting that kind of feels like this, where it's just meandering conversations, everyone's talking about the things they're doing and nothing really happens out of it? Yeah, well, every week. <laughs> <laughs> every week, yeah, indeed, I concur. Yeah, and in my mind, it, it's primary the primarily the result of a meeting goal and a meeting deliverable. So you could pick any one of these and make that your lever. And what that means is that if you make a conscious decision to alter one aspect of it, it affects the whole feedback cycle. So uh, you can imagine ways to change any piece of this and have it affect everything else. So. Um, one example of that is the number of attendees. So if the number of if you force the number of attendees down, it will decrease your meeting complexity. And because you have fewer people there, it will inc increase the pace that you get through things. So you'll have fewer unaddressed topics, which means you have a smaller scope. If you decrease the meeting complexity, so you implement some sort of a process, um, you can have a positive impact on the on the pace. So the number of unaddressed topics goes down. Uh, you can narrow the scope of the meeting. So instead of saying, we're going to fix all of permitting, you know, we're going to fix our mailings. And that's a smaller subset of people, which leads to a smaller complexity. So you can see how um, implementing levers at various stages of this circle can have um, serious recursive effects. Um, if you have a process set up for unaddressed things like a parking lot that's an ongoing parking lot, you can put them in unaddressed topics, which means that you'll have a more refined meeting scope, again, with fewer numbers of attendees. All these things affect each other, and if you can control one, you can control all of them. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to try and talk about ways that we can focus on a meeting goal and a meeting deliverable in a small scale way while downgrading meeting complexity to reduce this feedback cycle. And I want to talk about that a little bit. So one of the things that we talked about controlling the meeting pace is complexity. And one of the ways that you can get at complexity is by implementing a structure in your meetings. So the benefits of having a facilitated exercise and whether you actually have it facilitated by someone external or internal, having an exercise has a lot of benefits. So it manages to get everyone focused. Um, usually when you're doing these structured activities, you end up with a deliverable. And usually that deliverable will also help summarize the event. And because you're using an activity, 
it makes people more comfortable with the idea of developing at least a very basic agenda because you'll want people to know that you're doing an exercise ahead of time and to know what that exercise is so that people can do research and have understanding coming in to that training. So there are a lot of tool types that you can use. Um, I have some personal favorites, but there are tools that exist both in the Lean Toolbox and elsewhere, including um, things to help with root cause analysis, so understanding why things are problems, brainstorming or coming up with solutions, problem solving tools, and decision making. Um, sometimes it can feel hopeless when you have a meeting set up and everyone's just kind of kind of show up and it's a brainstorming session but it's just a bunch of people showing up in a room and some people talk more than others. Anyone, um, anyone ever feel like if everyone just sort of shows up to a meeting with a blank invite and you just know that nothing is going to come out of that meeting? John, I've gone into meetings and everyone there, almost everyone there, except for the maybe the organizer has, has no clue as to what the meeting is about or why they even called the meeting. Yeah. All right. Um, does anyone have an example? So I'm gonna I'm gonna talk through uh, one in particular that I really like to explore. Uh, but before I do, does anyone have any some examples of some facilitation exercises that can sort of get at root cause analysis, brainstorming, problem solving, or decision making? I know you green belts out there are gonna have a ton. So the brainstorming, do you want us to give you the example that we used in our session of brainstorming when we sat together, John? If you want to, yeah. I'm trying to remember, um, what is it that we did? It's what? How might we? Uh, let's see. I'm trying to remember what we did. It was a question to invoke everybody getting started on what it is of uh, thinking about what we're going to be doing and it was how do we um what was the question john how do we was, go ahead yeah the, the tool is is sort of a how might we question so it's a it's a specific way of phrasing brainstorming questions to come up with ideas but there are a lot of brainstorming tools out there and um, I would once again take a moment to advocate for the book Thinker Toys, which is a absolutely phenomenal book that um, has a whole bunch of facilitated exercises in it. Anyone else want to suggest a tool? I can think of at least one root cause analysis tool I really like. All right. I was thinking of um, fishbone oh. diagrams. Oh, yeah. Fishbone. fishbone diagrams are one of my favorite tools because it is a tool for developing understanding, but it also is a really great summary tool. So it shows off a bunch of information that um, is the result of those meetings. So today uh, you and I are going to have a facilitated exercise. So we are going to fix meetings all of us together, and I have outlined a bunch of potential ideas to solve meetings. Um, some of them are extremely unrealistic, and some of them are very realistic. Um, but I want you to pick which one we're going to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop a survey into the chat. And I want everyone to go ahead and take a moment. <laughs> Teresa is very excited about the puppy meeting. Um, and go ahead and participate in that survey. I would encourage everyone to go ahead and try that. And we'll go ahead and go with whatever one gets the most votes. So I understand that you may not know what puppy meetings is yet. But sometimes this is the only information you have about an idea. And we're going to explore 
um, the one that everyone picks based on the survey. So I'm going to go to the survey and we'll check out the responses and see as they come in live. Uh, for those of you that, that have never used Microsoft Forms before, it's really cool and really versatile. I'm working on a training right now to, to do that. All right, looks like a race between puppy meetings and mandatory note-taking decision log. No one likes my West Wing idea? I really like that idea, but it's hard to conceptualize it in the near future. Oh, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> and also, was... when we do, we do end up talking in the hallway a lot, and then other people, like, we disturb other people. So it's kind of like, you can't win. Mm. Yeah. All right. Mm. Uh, looks, looks like mandatory note taking with decision log is in the clear lead. Oh, wow. I would like to know more about what puppy meetings are though. Uh, Teresa, would you like to explain puppy meetings? Cause yeah. that was your so, child. Um, I think that, it would be super awesome if every time you went to a meeting, there was just like a couple of puppies. So like while you're having the meeting, if maybe like you're not participating, you can just be like petting a puppy. And if it's stressful, you can just like also <laughs> have a puppy and like it would just make the meeting better. Um, is it realistic inside national life? Maybe not. Is it very realistic at home? Depends if you have a puppy. Oh, Rebecca, there are a million questions you could ask, such as uh, what happens to the puppies and what happens when there are no longer puppies is uh, what happens to all the poop. There's a million there's a million um, challenges there. But like that's where our mind goes to these kinds of problems is like, what are the ways that in which this is infeasible? But uh, most of the votes have been to the mandatory note taking with the decision log. All right, so um, that is a complex idea. And I think it would be fun if we dissected that. Now, one option is I just uh, open it up to an entire room full of people and say, Okay, so I want to make uh, mandatory note taking and decision logs. Um, I want to I want to mandate that across the entire state. So now all meetings have this, maybe. And you would probably have a bunch of reasons to tell me why I can't do that. And that's what we call a certain type of thinking which is black hat thinking. So by default, I find, and I'm curious to know your thoughts on this too, um, when you're trying to solve a problem and everything is shooting down potential solutions to that problem, and then you come out of a meeting with no solutions to the problem, just an idea or two that are shot full of holes. Has anyone ever had that experience? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, I everyone likes being the black hat. Everyone likes talking about all the ways that something can't work, and it's a really uh, toxic mindset that I find permeates most meetings. So we're going to talk about a tool to get past that, which is the six hat theory. So there's two main ways that you can apply this to your meetings. One is uh, you can assign roles. So if you've got a meeting with at least six people, you can say you're the black hat, you're the blue hat, you're the yellow hat. Alternatively, if you have uh, either a whole bunch of people or not enough people, you can sort of step through each hat and talk through how you might look at the problem from that perspective because it gets people to focus on different perspectives than the natural, which is the black hat. 
So uh, let's think Blue Hat. So we talked about making mandatory note taking and decision logs for meetings. Uh, theoretically, that might mean every meeting, but what sort of thinking organization or planning might we need to do to make that a reality? Does anyone want to offer a suggestion there? To make it a reality across the board in the state, it would mean leadership approval across the board and be making it mandatory. Okay. You would need a platform on which everyone can access, store, and edit those notes very easily across the state. Okay. What are some other um, what are some other process pieces that would need to be in place to make this work? You need people to understand or to know how to take effective notes. Absolutely. So some training. I'm seeing some things about timekeeping. It's a great idea. Sometimes file sharing can be a challenge depending on the technical capabilities of whoever's involved in the meeting. Microsoft Teams has helped for the groups that, that we have Teams for, uh, but not, not every group is on Teams. Yeah. Um, Tracy says buy-in. That's absolutely essential. Yeah, ensuring buy-in is absolutely critical. I mean, it's a massive undertaking that would require everyone to do it all the time. So you need to make it as easy as possible and you need to think through the ways in which it's challenging. So maybe you can imagine talking about a staged rollout where you try it in a place, make sure it works, work out all the kinks before you roll it out to the entire, before you roll it out into the entire state. Um, anything else? Any other Blue Hat ideas? This, this is Rebecca. It's not really an idea, but something that I struggle with frequently is finding that right balance between buy-in from my staff, um, you know, wanting their input. Um, but then sometimes the more I give, the more discontent there seems to be. So finding that balance between buy-in um, and doing it in a way that works for everybody. And also sometimes you just need to suck it up and do it. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. I think we talked about some of the process steps. Let's talk um, Green Hat a little bit. So maybe the root idea is a good one, but maybe it's a little too harsh or maybe a slight tweak or adjustment would be would greatly benefit the implementation. So what are some Green Hats? What are some ideas or alternatives? Or we can um, always come back to that after we do the, <laughs> Teresa says, add puppies and kittens. Yeah, maybe the note taker gets to cuddle a puppy. But make people more willing to take notes. Positive energy and genuine excitement. Use lean tools. How do you um, get a volunteer to take notes? Sometimes it's a round robin type of thing. We all take a crack at it. Some people don't like taking notes at all. Um, and we'll always, well, I find that some of the black hat people not do not like taking the notes um, every time. And they, they, they say that right at the beginning that they're just simply not gonna take the notes. And that's mm -hmm. to overcome sometimes. I think yeah. also sharing that the point of taking notes is not to write down everything that everybody says. It's not like you're taking lecture notes in college. It's to keep track of decisions and action items and how to keep moving things forward. And that can kind of get people, I think, a little bit more buy-in to like the idea of notes because it's actually it's a record of our decisions and our 
process more so than just the collection of everything everybody said in the meeting. Mm -hmm. And just um, some of the chat things that are coming up, uh, some comments that I really liked. Um, a standard template that can be used or tweaked depending on the type of meeting is a great idea, Aaron. Um, so Teresa also suggested candy to get people to take notes. Um, Maureen said something that hit me right in the feels, which is sit in silence until someone finally caves. Uh, and, and so one other comment is that as a note taker, it's actually really hard to be involved in the conversation meeting. Someone's got their black hat on. We're getting there. All right. So let's talk uh, White Hat. So White Hat focuses on information and data. It's about being objective and making database decisions. So if we are advocating for this universal note taking, what type of data or facts do we either have or would we need to have in order to make a more compelling case and to have a more effective plan? Well, notes will provide a log of information that you can go back to um, when you have questions about the meeting. Um, and then also, if you have notes and it has the action items, then you can go back to the action items to complete them. So I would just say, I guess in terms of information and data neutral and objectivity is that good notes, when good notes are taken there um, can be really helpful for people attending the meeting to know what happened and for people who are not at the meeting to also know what happened. Sure. John, it's Teresa. Um, I think before I kind of started implementing, I'd want to know kind of what percent of meetings already are taking notes and kind of objectively what's working well for them versus not well, and then use that information to develop whatever this idea morphs into. Yeah, and as a reminder, we did um, we did survey staff on uh, what they didn't like or what wasn't happening in their meetings and lack of outcomes, action items and minutes was the number one thing that came out of it. That might make a really compelling case for people are noticing that they're not having minutes and they're not having action items be recorded and that it's a well-known aspect and a white hat would point that out. And Teresa's right, we don't know who's doing it right now. Work plan be used instead of minutes. Sure. And um, that's one of the things that I really like about like fishbone diagrams, for example, is that completing the fishbone diagram is kind of like taking the meeting minutes. It, it is it is a summary of the meeting and all of the things that happened in the meeting. It's just a, a succinct summary of that. And if this was not a, um, if I wasn't concerned about what I was showing on the screen right now, I would probably be taking each of these blue hat, green hat, white hat idea notes because it fits very nicely into these like packets. It's like we're brainstorming for, you know, six different categories. All right. So uh, let's talk a little bit about yellow hat. So that's benefits. So this one should be really easy. So um, some people, I think, were mentioning some yellow hat ideas when we were talking about the white hat, but it's really why does it make sense to have meeting notes? And why does it make sense to do that? What are the benefits of doing that kind of work? Record and accountability jump to my mind. Mm -hmm. For sure. Everyone's on the same page, says Annette. It's great. It also helps if you are having less frequent meetings, say like an annual or semi-annual meeting, where you can just refer to your notes rather than ending up with the exact same discussion every single time that group of people gets together. I don't know how to say that succinctly.
Yeah, and I know I've heard complaints about revisiting past decisions that everybody thought were made, um, where that stuff gets rehashed endlessly. Aaron says some auditors look for meeting notes. Yeah, it could absolutely be um, be of benefit to have handy when auditors come knocking. Excellent. All right. Um, let's talk Red Hat. So most of what we've done to this point has been fairly logical and data oriented or process oriented, but Red Hat's about feelings. So intuition, hunches, gut instinct. You don't have to give a reason. Just tell me some of the emotions that come to mind when you think of this mandatory note-taking slash uh, action point log that we've talked about. It could be positive or negative. Well, I, this is Christina at the Agency of Ag, and one of the things that we've um, encountered over the past several weeks as we moved into Teams and moved away from using the share drive is that people are taking notes and then other people can't find the notes because they're like being saved in new places. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, what is the utility? I think some people could say, well, I don't see that there's any reason for us to have notes because I don't even know where to find them and nobody ever looks at them. I guess that is a reason, but. Yeah. And, um, Mike says it gives him anxiety. Danielle says worry. Uh, forcing every conversation to be more formal. Relief that someone is taking notes. Some people will like taking notes. Uh, no time to review the notes and make sure they're accurate. Sure, everyone sort of has a different perspective that they come into the meetings. Or worry that they'll be incomplete because folks will be distracted and not complete the notes. Does the word mandatory scare anyone? It scares me a little bit. Yes. Well, I guess it's, I don't know, sometimes there's certain meetings where I, I don't think taking notes would be useful because they're so simple and done. Like you saw what you had to solve or they're very brief. And I mean, I don't think it would apply to absolutely 100% of the meetings, I think. Maybe the most common. Sure. I could imagine a... Um... I could imagine there being some stipulation about like the number of participants or the length of the meeting. There's a lot. There's a lot of things to work on to come out of it. And um, maybe in an ideal world, you do every other hat before you come to the green hat and you've got all these ideas listed out for things that you want to address or look at or think about. And, where feelings really come into play is when you're talking about messaging. So, you know, if we have these feelings and it stands to reason that other people would have similar feelings. Biases in note-taking, sure. Yeah, you could definitely be concerned about that. I think we're leaning into the black hat a little bit, so let's go for it. Um, what, are, what are the reasons this won't work? Uh, what are the risks... What are the weaknesses and dangers of this approach? Let me have it. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure you can think of a million. Every single one of these ideas um, has all sorts of challenges and concerns. Yeah, mandatory does imply that there are consequences for not taking notes. And what is a reasonable con what is a reasonable consequence for not taking notes? Or really, like, how would anyone know? Like, what's the incentive to do it if there's no, like, 
note taking overlord who checks in after every meeting for your notes. Yep. <laughs> Margaret says not holding a meeting because you worry about the note taking. Sure. Um, and Teresa's spot on with the who's going to know. Uh, yeah, because nobody is. We, we all know that they're not going to hire someone whose job it is to make sure that notes are being taken. Yeah, people will just resort to one on one meetings and hiding from the the note taker responsibilities. Yeah, being inconsistently applied. Sure. And, you know, maybe um, you can start with the black hat, right? Because we can all think of all the ways in which uh, this won't work, that this is utterly infeasible and an utterly ridiculous idea. But challenging yourself to think of like, okay, but assuming that it's not a ridiculous and plausible idea that no one would ever do, how could we make it happen? Because, yeah, John Fay is spot on. So anyone that saw my training last week, uh, we talked about TikTok. And the basic premise is you split a piece of paper right down the middle. On one side, you write down your fears and concerns. On the other side, you write down ways in which you can overcome those challenges. So Six Hat is really a, instead of um, it being a piece of paper split down the middle, it's basically a six sided piece of that where um, you write down your concerns and your challenges as, as well as all these other elements and the way that things can work really well. And it's about getting people out of that mindset of someone had the audacity to submit an idea and it deserves more than just let's poke all the holes in it and let's get to thinking through how this might actually work. And this is a, a, a meeting structure that we can go through really quickly. Um, you notice that that took us about 20 minutes or so to, to, to walk through. And we covered a lot of ground. Um, it's amazing how much ground you can cover when you don't allow the black hat to dominate the discussion. Because we could endlessly poke holes in any idea if we think long and hard enough but it's worth doing the other stuff to find out if it works um just reading some of the comments here yeah bad note taking and you know i'll admit to not being an amazing note taker um i was in college because i had to be um but that's a skill that you develop and you grow so people might start off as bad note takers and we might expect that, but if everyone was doing it, then everyone would be getting a little better at it. I would hope. Well, so Danielle, um, one of the things that I like for countering the dominance of the black hat is having an organizational structure to the meeting because then people are more focused on the tool rather than just poking holes and stuff. Because poking holes and stuff is fun and it's easy and it's the way human brains work. We hear a new idea and we're like, ooh, change. What's our, what are all the things that are wrong with it? I know I've caught myself doing that and I'm trained to not do that. Uh, it, it's an unfortunate feature of our biology. Um, I think TikTok is a really powerful tool if you just want like a small structured thing that you can do, because it gets everyone's negative ideas out on the page and gets them in a more positive frame of reference. If you are interested in learning more about TikTok, as well as an awesome continuous improvement tool that Teresa Petzelt and I worked on putting together, go ahead and check out our Microsoft Stream link, which I will go ahead and throw in the chat. Um, this is the Lean Learning Series training page. You can see all the trainings that we've given in the past. Check out the bite-sized Lean event to learn about TikTok. It's a really great way of countering the black hat thinking. All right. So I want to finish today's meeting with some of what was promised on the cover, which is uh, talking a little bit about online meetings. 
because they are a slightly different animal to regular meetings. Um, by now, all of this, by now, some of this is probably old news to you as you've seen it. Um, how, how long we've been doing this now for at least a month. It feels like forever, I know, but. Um, so asking questions to directly engaging the attendees, and this is important, making space to mute and unmute. Um, either for technical difficulties or just to answer the questions. I know sometimes it can feel a little awkward when I ask you guys a question and then sort of have to sit through some silence, but it takes bearing that, uh, it takes bearing that a little bit of awkwardness in favor of getting your feedback and thoughts and comments, which are incredibly valuable and I greatly appreciate. Also, Try and always use video when it's available, especially if it's a meeting of like, I don't know, I'd say under 10 people. Uh, our human biology is triggered by seeing other human beings' faces and seeing people move and talk and seeing how people react. Yeah, and, and Jill, it, it's absolutely true. People won't speak up if you don't give them the time to speak. And it's really hard to think and do when you're working online. It's really easy to just keep the ball rolling and make the space for it. And I don't do it perfectly all the time either. And sometimes people talk over each other. And so if you are looking for particular responses from people, you can indicate that you want particular responses from them that would help that challenge a little bit. But in a, in a meeting this size, I, don't have enough control over that. Um, and we talked a little bit about the different ways that we can communicate. If your primary aim for a meeting is informing, so if you or a group of people are interested in communicating idea or ideas to a bunch of other people and you don't need their human feedback, consider using a live event. So, um, I can share this information too, but um, uh, Marcella Dent put together a really great informational document on live events. But basically, when you go to create a new meeting in Teams, one of the options in the drop down is new live event. Live events allow up to 10,000 participants, and they, are, they give you basically two separate links, one for um, producers and presenters, one for attendees. And attendees can all show up to attend a meeting, uh, but they can't talk. And so if all you're trying to do is educate a large number of people on a topic, definitely, definitely, definitely consider using live events. Or even if it's not a gigantic meeting, if it's just 30 people, but it's just me communicating to a bunch of people and I don't want... Um, there's still an opportunity for Q&A, but it's through the chat. If you enable that functionality... But if informing is your goal, you can consider live events. I've considered live events for these trainings, but I really want to hear your voices and talk to you because I like these to be sort of conversational. So that was all I had for today. I have additional resources. Um, this NOAA training resources is really, really great. I'll go ahead and drop a link in the chat. Um, that's why I felt like I could skip a lot of the stuff and jump right into like, here are the best practices. Now let's talk about why those best practices don't happen. Um, they really cover a lot of the ground and go into a lot more depth philosophically of this information right here. All right, any questions? John, you have a question in the chat, which is, if you have a group of people struggling with production, productive meetings, is there a way to have someone help out? Yeah, so um, yeah, I could drop the other links in the chat, too. Um, so I, at least in DEC, I am, or ANR, I am the Greenbelt coordinator. So um, if you would like an independent facilitator to facilitate a meeting, that is a service that we can provide, and I can reach out to Greenbelts 
to try and find someone that would take an interest in facilitating that meeting. And if we can't find anyone and I have the time available, I'll do it myself. Um, if you are not in ANR, um, you can contact Justin and ask for a Greenbelt to facilitate a meeting. I don't think I've talked to many Greenbelts that are like, Ugh, I wouldn't want to facilitate an hour long meeting because we all need the experience and there aren't enough of the big old lean projects going around, especially these days, that having someone who knows it's their job to, you know, when they're online, make space for people to talk as well as um, has enough expertise with tools to be able to deploy it and help everyone through them. Uh, then, so John Fay asked um, for the PowerPoint. Yeah, I will convert all these to PDFs. Rebecca, it was nice talking to you. Um, John asked if the PowerPoints will be available. Yeah, I can PDF them and make them all available. And I'll send out a link um, to that on the couple of places where I know to do that. Um, could someone observe and identify where you can improve? Danielle, um, are you talking about improve as a facilitator or um, improve meetings in general? Because the biggest takeaway for a meeting is like, have a goal, have a thing that you're trying to accomplish. If you can do that, then it will simplify everything else. It'll narrow your scope. It'll get your participants down. If you can tackle that piece, it'll all go all right. I guess I'm thinking that we have a weekly meeting and it's just always, always every time gets derailed. We always have an agenda. You know, we always have times assigned for that and it just never really um, works. And so just, just to have somebody sort of observe our process and make recommendations of like how we could improve that would be really helpful because maybe there are just certain things that we're not doing very well that we could do better on or I I don't know but um, it would just be nice to have somebody who could that has the experience and is a neutral party that could really look at how we are interacting and, and help. All right Danielle I'd be happy to talk about it with you offline and if anyone else has any similar issues that they want to talk about, um, you know, I'm always on Teams, so feel free to drop me a, a chat line and we can get to talking. I hope you enjoyed today's training. Um, we'll be having one next week as well. And check out that stream link to check out any of the trainings you might have missed. Um, thank you all for your time and have a great day. Thank you. You too. Thank you.